as I preach in your hearing by the grace of God. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. Next week I want to uh, revisit the prayer, prayer part. Rejoice, pray, give thanks, repeat. Part 8, Praying Through the Bible. Number 343. The Bible reads in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Rejoice evermore, period. That is a commandment that is not a suggestion. I have been telling people that you, as a Christian, you have the power by the grace of God to choose to do the right thing and pray and ask God to help you to do the right thing, and He will. So make up your mind that you're going to be a rejoicing Christian, that you're going to be a Christian, a person full of joy, no matter the circumstances. Rejoice evermore, period. That is not a suggestion, that is a commandment. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. Again, not a suggestion, a commandment. Just choose to do it. And God will help you, I assure you. Verse 18, in everything. Notice that Paul didn't say, in keeping with verse 16 and 17, straightforward, down the line, commandment and just said give thanks without ceasing or give thanks forever he didn't do that he made it clear that in everything give thanks in everything give thanks period Uh, uh, colon rather In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You want to be in the will of God? Give thanks. People who are truly born again, they don't have a problem with that. Their heart is fixed on giving thanks and praise for every blessing. Holy Father God, we pray that you would visit with us once again. Uh, Lord, on a Wednesday, as we continue to preach on prayer, encouraging your uh, born-again ones to pray uh, without ceasing according to your holy word, and to give thanks always uh, under all circumstances, and to rejoice forevermore. And, Lord, we thank you for uh, your visits with us down through the years. And we pray that you would do it again. We individually confess our sins, our failures and faults, and hopefully collectively. For Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us and cleanse us from all sin and all unrighteousness. Because you will not dwell with us, you will not fellowship with us if we have sin in the camp. If we have sin in the camp of our lives, unrepented of sin. Lord, help us all to confess our sins, no matter what it is, a bad attitude, hatefulness, bitterness, resentfulness, lying, dishonesty, deceit, bad attitudes, grieving and quenching your Holy Spirit, can't stand any good work to go forward. Being a Judas and being a Sanballat and a Tobias. Lord, whatever the sin is, help people to leave it alone. Help people to confess it and to repent of it and to turn away from it. Cleanse our vessels and make us fit for your use. Lord, this afternoon, crush and crucify our flesh, the old man within us, and fill us with the power, the unction, and the anointing of your Holy Spirit from on high. Lord God in heaven, I know that thou art there and that you're here and that you have all might and power in your hand. And uh, Lord, I thank you for reminding me of 
my life's verse. I don't know how it became my life's verse. Only you know that. But tucked away in the Old Testament. Uh, Lord, you made it clear that it is not by might nor by power. That is by human effort and human ingenuity and all of the gifts that you've given to us. And none of it will work without the power of your Holy Spirit. Uh, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. So, Lord, we humbly ask you to demonstrate the power of your Holy Spirit. We don't deserve it, but we pray that you would for the benefit of the people who need to hear your word. Break their icy hard hearts and stubborn wills and help them to submit to you, to trust you as Savior. If that is what they need uh, and or to repent of their sins as a believer and uh, get their hearts right with you and unburden their uh, souls and their spirits and their consciences uh, so that they can be free. For there's nothing like it on your uh, green earth than to be free in Jesus Christ. I thank you for it and I pray that millions more would experience it for real, deep down. Not anything fake, not anything phony. For something real. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in a rather long but wonderful series of messages from the Word of God titled, Praying Through the Bible. Praying Through the Bible. Praying with the Bible. A series on every passage and verse regarding prayer. Prayer in the Bible in context. The purpose of this series is to encourage you and to, to pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I assure you, beloved, after getting saved, To trust in Christ as your Savior, believing on Christ, one of the greatest things you can do is to pray to God and to pray without ceasing. We have highlighted each of these over 500 verses and passages in the Prayer Motivator Devotional Bible. So far, we have completed 342 messages in a row every Wednesday in this series by the grace of God oftentimes under dire circumstances this is message number 343 titled rejoice pray give thanks repeat after you are born again along with obedience that's what you ought to be doing this is part 8 Part 8. And I'm so thrilled to be here to share this message with you. J.A. Brodus said, We ought to be thankful for everything. Are you thankful for everything? <clears throat> we ought to be thankful for everything painful as well as pleasant. May God help his people. For we have far too many who are thankful for the pleasant things and are not thankful for the painful things. But just like a basketball player said the other night, he said, you don't learn anything when you win, but you learn a lot when you lose. And he's right about that. Same thing goes for the Christian our greatest growth spurts come uh, during the days of pain and 
heartache and difficulty and toiling and fighting the battle. Dr. Curtis Hudson read back one day and preached a series titled Building and Battling. Building and Battling. Building and Battling. And that's what the Christian life is about, building and battling. He goes on to say, uh, Mr. Brodus, we can always be thankful that a thing is not worse. Can somebody say amen? Are you living? Thank God that you're not dead. We can always be thankful that things are not worse. Because they could be. If it were worse, it would be no more so than our sins make us deserve. Amen, somebody. Go ahead, Mr. Brodus. Go ahead. When trouble comes over us, we learn to appreciate that as a blessing which is gone. In this series, my beloved, we have talked about the importance of obeying the commandment of God, rejoice evermore, always rejoicing. Pray without ceasing, always praying. And by the grace of God, I want to visit that one again next week. There's much to say about that that one verse, pray without ceasing. Now we turn our attention to the third commandment in this triplet series of verses. Always giving thanks. My God, my God, help your people. For Lord, we, like the Israelites, are a murmuring bunch, a complaining bunch, a sad bunch, a mad bunch, always seeking a pity party, always seeking somebody to show us pity, always crying the victim. Murmuring and complaining, crying and boo-hooing, always want to join the nod the head class where everybody agrees with you in your mess. I like what Condoleezza Rice said, yeah, I am against uh, men hitting on me and things like that and hitting on women and trying to get with them uh, uh, in illicit relationships. But she read back and said, but I don't want to make women snowflakes. When women are tougher than that. They can handle themselves if they want to. They don't have to fall into that foolishness. They can stand strong and be strong. She said, I, we don't want to make women into snowflakes. Whiners and complainers and uh, get mad at every little thing somebody says. Uh, sad to say we have enough men who are snowflakes today. Women don't know what to do with these men today. Men today are like they don't even know how to approach a woman. Because they're snowflakes themselves. Always crying. Always sensitive. Uh, and breaking down because somebody disagreed with them, boo-hooing, want somebody to uh, feel sorry for them. Anyway, the Bible reads, in everything, give thanks. Now, I'm going to shock and amaze you, but the Greek word translated as everything means everything. It literally means everything. <laughs> it means all things, individually and collectively. It 
it encompasses each, every, any, the whole thing, everyone, all things, and some of all types, everything, everything, everything. In everything, give thanks. Your mama died, give thanks. Thank God for the years she lived. Can somebody, amen lights. Your daddy died. Thank God he didn't suffer longer than what he did. Amen somebody. I never shed a tear of my dad dying. There was never a man more loving than my dad. He loved his children. He loved us and his wife to a fault. Letting us get away with murder. He didn't know any better. He did the best he could. Very loving man. He's the first man I saw the real love of Christ. Took a lot. Took a lot. But I never shed a tear for my dad when he died, not one time. In fact, I feel closer, I, I have felt closer to my dad since he died than when he was alive. I made peace with my dad a long time before he died. And we had a wonderful relationship. And, uh, he just loved the fact, he used to call me the Apostle Paul because I was traveling all over the world and preaching the gospel. And he uh, used to just rejoice in that. He never wanted to travel himself. Uh, I had to take an older preacher with me, about his age, uh, with me to the Philippines. Uh, because uh, he, he didn't want to travel like that. He was a down-home man. But I never shed a tear. I thank God for the life he lived. With all of the problems, all of the difficulties, I rejoiced that he was out of pain and he was in heaven with the Lord. I believe my, out of all my family members, listen to me carefully, out of all of my family members, that is my mom and them, if, there, if, if there's any of them going to heaven, it's my dad. I know I'm going by the grace of God, but I know my dad is in heaven. I never shed a tear. I was grateful to God for the life he lived. There is no exception. The apostle Paul makes uh, to the command to give thanks in all things. No exception. Watch this. You're in the hospital right now in traction. Thank God for the thousands of days you were not in the hospital in traction. You had a car accident today. You almost died. Thank God for all the days you didn't have a car accident. And you didn't almost die. Amen. Somebody. Your four-year-old daughter is sick. Thank God for all the days she was not sick. And thank God you got a place to take her to to get checked out. You say, but aren't we supposed to worry and aren't we supposed to fret and get all up in arms about things, you know, and get some furrows in our brow and and, and look like the thinking man? No. Be thankful for everything. There's always something to be thankful for. There is no exception. The, the Apostle Paul makes to the command to give thanks in all things. Regarding this passage, E.L. Hull said... These words form the last of a series of seemingly impossible precepts or commandments. <clears throat> what? Perpetual joy? What? 
perpetual prayer, united in a life of what? Perpetual thanksgiving? Of course, these do not refer to acts, but to a state of heart and a state of spirit and a state of mind. Can somebody say amen? However, even then, the difficulty is not removed. Toil and rest, success and failure, we have it all. By the way, I feel sorry for people who toil but don't rest. I feel sorry for people who uh, have nothing but failure and no success. There's something wrong somewhere. You need both. Life is not worth living if you can't do that. Events that cheer us or overshadow us are all to be received, not only submissively, but thankfully. And so are the tremendous sorrows, I said, or he said, the tremendous sorrows which shatter the human heart. What? For those of you who are romantics, you've had your heart broken several times. When are you going to learn to stop being a romantic and trying to, and, and, and trying to be... Juliet and Romeo. And you got just as many men. I saw a man crying the other night. Bless his little heart. I ain't never cried over no woman. But he cried. Tall. Uh, impressive looking individual. I, just, I, I, I was turning the channel and I switching. The, you know, I don't watch mess like that now. You know that. I was just, I was just journeying. I was traveling through the television system. And I saw this grown, big old man, had to be 6'4", had his head and neck bent down crying. I, I said, let me, what, why is this man crying? And one of those little dating shows, there's so many of them now, they're so stupid. Excuse me. They're so stupid. Crying. And then I saw a caption that said, Jason really loved Belinda. I said, oh, my soul. I, I, I'm not talking about weep. I'm not talking about weeping. I'm talking about crying. I mean, coming from his gut because she had, uh, uh, I guess, quit him or broke his heart and was seeing somebody else or something. I don't know. One of these, one of these stupid dating shows, marriage shows, marriage. You know, you know anything called uh, marriage on the spot or uh, marriage at first sight is crazy. It's stupid. It's stupid. But anyway, but the people love this mess. You know why? Because that's what they want. Crying his head off. Some of y'all uh, have not recovered from a broken heart because uh, Romeo left you or Juliet left you. And you got men and women all broken down with broken hearts. Uh, God bless you. You romantics. You need to learn uh, uh, to stop putting uh, all of that trust and love in somebody and then but but I hear back from Romeo and Juliet oh but you don't know what it means to love somebody and if you don't feel some pain the love with the pain you got to with the with the love you got to have the pain I know you don't but people are people all over the country all over the world hearts are broken Always on a roller coaster of love. Always on a roller coaster of room. Either it's hot and ready or it's uh, uh, cold and dead. Broken hearts. How can this precept be obeyed? These precepts. Rejoice evermore. Period. Bam. Pray without ceasing. Period. Bam. In everything, 
give thanks. For this is the will of God concerning you. Bam, period, bam. What? He goes on to say, the method of attaining these precepts or these commandments is not to be reached by a single resolution or in a day by an outburst of excited feeling. I'm sure you remember the story, the fable about the turtle and the hare. We got, we got a whole lot of hairy Christians. I didn't say Hare Krishna, I said Harry Christians. The hares, they start out real fast and burst out and promise everything and, and we find them, uh, behind a tree and the turtle comes along steady and faithful. How many of y'all know folk like that? Got hares. They promise everything, they vow everything up front, and man, they say, they say, bless God, I'm gonna do it, and I'm gonna be faithful, and, uh, the turtle goes by very slowly, faithful, and for sure, hadn't said a word, passes the hair, leaning up, leaning up against a tree, tied, worn out, beat up, chased, and the turtle said, hey there, hair, what happened to you? And how whimpers back, I don't want to talk about it. You keep on going. We may say sincerely, henceforth I resolve to trust God in everything. But little vexations soon shake our trust. Greater troubles break down our resolution. Bam, bam. The devil do a one, two, uh, left jab, right jab, and you, you wobbling. Uh, you wobbling. Just a little trouble will knock some of us out. I was uh, pastoring a church one time, and man, we were out soul winning, witnessing every day souls were getting saved. The church was filling up. We had our largest crowd. And man, my most faithful soul winner. Bless her heart, Mrs. Finkley. I mean, man, she was there. She beat me there. Every day we were out knocking on doors. Shaking the hedges. Shaking the gates of hell. We were excited. We were fired up. And we were ready to go. Prayed up. One day I went to the church and she was not there. I saw a husband who hardly came. He was back in the back, looking long face. And I said, where's Mrs. Finkley? He said, uh, Pastor, his, uh, her half-brother that she didn't even know, she just found out he died. I said, excuse me. <laughs> I, said, I said, what? I said, her half brother that she didn't know died. And so I said, well, where is she? Uh, he, Pastor, she's in the bed. I said, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? She's our greatest soul winner. She, she's Mrs. Faithful. Uh, Pastor, I think she wants you to, you to come by and visit. I said, we can ready to go out so winning. Pastor, I think you need to. And I ignored him. But he knew his wife better than I knew. <laughs> it's, I laugh at it now. It's sad. I lost one of the most faithful families in that church because I didn't, go, I didn't stop what I was doing to go visit Mrs. Finkley. A one-two punch knocked out. Bam! That's not even one two point, just one one jab, bam, she was gone. Yeah, I was a young young preacher, fired up, ready to go, and you know, said something like I can't let the devil stop me. <laughs> oh my soul. And I finally went by the visitor, she was mad as fired me. 
and uh, I was trying to be as diplomatic and nice as I could. And uh, I said, now, Mrs. Finkley, you, your husband tell me you didn't even know this half-brother. Is that correct? She said, yes. <laughs> and she was crying. I said, well, I, I, okay, now, I said, I, I said, are you sure you didn't know? Yes, sir. Yes, Pastor, I'm sure. I said, well, okay, then. I didn't want to say, well, why are you crying? <laughs> I just, uh, see, and that's what Pastor Glennie Hammond kept telling me. <laughs> he said, I kept asking him, what should I do in a different situation? He said, that's all right. The, the people will teach you. <laughs> he said, they'll teach you. She so taught me, I tell you. It, it, just because I, it doesn't make sense to me, uh, you know, it still hurt her. You'd be amazed at what can knock folk out. Be that as it may, ladies and gentlemen, the emotion has declined, he said. And we say, no man can be always thankful. No man. That's what people say. Come on, nobody can be joyful all the time. No, nobody can pray all the time. Sometimes we got to work. Nobody can give thank, thanks all the time for everything. Come on now. <laughs> oh, man, you're crazy. Instead, he said, it is the gradual result of a life of earnest fellowship with God. A life that daily realizes the presence of of Almighty God, the Heavenly Father in your life. You got to grow into this thing, to be honest about it. That by prayer feels the reality of God's love. A life that comes at length to walk through all toils and temptations under a deep sense of the all surrounding God. God has got to be the center of your life for you to understand this. This Rejoicing evermore, this praying without ceasing, this giving thanks in everything. My marriage is hell, give thanks that you're both not in hell where you deserve to be. Be thankful. My son is acting like a demon, give thanks he's not in jail, acting like a demon. Yet... My oldest daughter, she's doing things that I was ho hoping that she would never do. Well, thank God she's still living. There's still hope. Be thankful for everything. And while you're thanking God that she's still alive, pray for her. Because grown people are going to do what they want to do. Uh, whether you like it or not. Just like you did. Did you do everything your parents wanted you to do? Nope. In fact, that's what you said. You used the word nope. You didn't say just no. You said nope. All you can do, once they're grown and on their own, is pray for them. That's all you can do. But I, now, now you should have done all you could do when they were home. Now, I'm not talking to people like who didn't do all they could do. You parents, you baby boomers who still think you're 17 years old. The problem is not the millennials. The problem has always been the baby boomers. We have lost our natural minds. We've lost our righteous minds, if we ever had it in the first place. Trying to blame the millennials. These millennials. No, no, no. These baby boomers. Some of y'all think, you, listen to me, some of you think you're still cute. And you 58. I have news for you. I don't care what you do. I can see your old self. You need to sit down somewhere trying to wear skinny jeans and yoga pants and still trying to get somebody's eye at the uh, grocery store. I, I see you. I see you. I saw some of y'all yesterday. But all I got to do is take a close look at you. You're trying to, uh, to dress like these young teeny boppers, these millennials, and trying to hook somebody because you're lonely, because you done ran off three men, 
or three wives being mean as the devil because our parents let us just go hog wild. We were, remember now, we were raised in the sexual revolution, so stop blaming the millennials. Blame yourself and tell the millennials the truth. In fact, in the sex department, bless their hearts, the millennials are doing better than the baby boomers today. So you, you just pray for your child now. And you better pray very hard if you have, you didn't raise that child right, according to the Word of God. Now let me ask you a question. Baby boomer, Christian baby boomer, did you pray with your millennials? In the morning time, every day, never missed? Did you take them to church with you and let them sit beside you? I went to a church one time in between took my little kids with me to a midweek service. And the youth pastor was the pastor's son. He came in with dreadlocks and uh, uh, earrings in his ear, jeans hanging off his pants. He was supposed to be the youth minister. And uh, I was supposed to release my children and let them go in there with this hula. And I said, no, they're going to stay with me. And so they were meeting in a little room. And I brought my children and my wife and, and my children. Pastor, why don't you just go ahead and let your children go on in there with the young people. I said, no, I'd rather keep them here with me. Pastor got mad. So no, I insist that you take them on in there with us. I said, well, I insist I'm going to leave if, if i got to take my children in there. And I walked out. I'm not going to leave my children. I, I never left my children anywhere. And I would advise you not to leave your children anywhere. Because, ladies and gentlemen, as I come to a close, and when most Baptist preachers say that, that's just a lie to try to comfort you. Because we are selfish it is far easier to be unthankful, ungrateful. Ingratitude comes about when we focus only on ourselves. Are you ungrateful? Are you selfish? And this is a fact. People who are selfish, only concerned about themselves, are un some of the most ungrateful people. And then you, you have people who are proud who are ungrateful. No matter what you do for them, they still won't say thank you. I make everybody in my family say thank you. I don't care how old you get. You better say thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, and you better act like you like it. Because <laughs> I'll take it from you. I taught my children, well, you, you had to thank God and thank me. God used me to give it to you. Ingratitude comes about when we focus only on ourselves because we are always seeing where something is needed, uh, something that we desire in our lives. Some of you are never satisfied. Some of you Christians are never satisfied. That's why you're always going to the mall. You're always going to Target. you got to have every little gadget in your house to do what? To have a yard sale to sell it in a, a year or two. Or to put it in a shed outside of your house that you got to pay rent. In some places, you're paying almost a house note to, to keep junk that you don't even use. That's why you're putting it out of the house. You're never satisfied. Your heart is never satisfied. You always want stuff. Never content. However, Paul delivers this command in everything, give things. Out of a life of suffering and lack. <clears throat> Paul was in jail giving thanks. Paul was in bonds giving thanks. 
all of Paul's prayers could have justifiably been about his own needs and desires and wants. Like it is for most of us today. We're so pitiful compared to Apostle Paul, it's not even funny. Paul testified that he was in stripes above measure. My God, help us. In prisons more frequent. He went to jail because of Christ. He got whipped because of Christ. In deaths oft, he faced death multiple times. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Some people believe that's when he went to heaven and saw the third heaven. When he was stoned in Lystra. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. I want you to notice that, that, that one right there. He said three times I suffered shipwreck. Now see, shipwreck is not necessarily persecution. See, this is, the, this is Paul bringing out his times of frustration. When you're going to try to help somebody, you're going to another land to tell people about the gospel. To tell folks about Jesus, you're doing good work. You're not being persecuted when the ship uh, breaks down. <clears throat> the devil may be behind it, but it's just frustrating when the car breaks down when you're trying to go do good. I remember one time we went, we were going soul winning, and uh, I believe it was this same campaign. Going out witnessing. And uh, somehow while we were pulling out of the church, two cars broke down. Just out of the blue. It was so frustrating. Three times shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. Out there drifting. I know that's frightening. In journeyings often, always hitting the road. See, I, I told my children, and I thank God I told them, I did all of my traveling while I was young. Journey, I mean, I traveled uh, to nearly every state in the USA, including Alaska, Hawaii, traveled to Asia, traveled to Europe multiple times, to Africa. Mexico, in journeyings often. I did it while I was young. I didn't, that was not my plan. God called me to preach all over the world while I was young. And uh, he mentions this because journeying is not fun, contrary to what people think. I feel sorry for people who get old and they wait to get old to go traveling around the world. I just feel sorry for you. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not for old people. Thank God my oldest two daughters following in my footsteps. They're traveling while they're young, all over the world, while they have the energy. Because that's why Paul is mentioning this. Journeying or journeying's often is not fun. Getting on buses and trains and planes in our day and time. I don't see how these old people do it. In perils of waters, in perils of robbers, <clears throat> Just yesterday, a man tried to rob. It. People are getting so bad today. A man tried to rob, uh, and and and, and uh, uh, carjack a car right in front of three or four police officers. When Paul traveled, he was faced with robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen. Do you know sometimes your worst enemies can be your own folk? Amen, somebody. Sometimes, listen to me very carefully, sometimes my greatest foes are my own people, black folk.
there have been times when white folks have been friendlier to me than my own people. <laughs> I said, I'm one of y'all now. It's all right, we're still against you because you preach too hard. Paul had that experience. His own kinfolk turned against him. In perils by the heathen, <clears throat> even the lost people, of course, were trying to kill him. In perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, I'm out in the wilderness and I'm still in trouble. In perils in the sea, now he really had some problems in the sea. This is the third time he mentioned the sea. He really, Paul had some problems with the water, I tell you what. In perils in the sea, in perils among, here we go, false brethren, doggone it. Mm -mm. Judas's. They're the worst. I don't, they're worse than your own people. They're worse than your own family. Judas is. Makes no difference what color a Judas is. A backstabber. A traitor. A liar. A thief. False brethren. Judas is all around. <clears throat> Paul had to deal with them just like Jesus did. In weariness. You know, this is just when you're tired. Uh, many of you don't know this. You know what I'm going to do? i got to help my son with a couple of things. Uh, but you know what I'm going to do after I preach? I do it almost every day. My wife goes with me. My baby daughter goes with me to protect me from my wife. And uh, I lay down. If I have some time, I go to sleep. Why? Weariness and painfulness. Some of you all are getting old. You start to experience painfulness. Some of y'all can hardly walk. You know it. You got pain in the ball of your foot. You can, you can hardly lean on that left leg for some reason. You don't know what it is. <laughs> You've been serving God for a long time, and now you're starting to feel pain. Painfulness in watchings often, <clears throat> always watching. You mark my words. Somebody, Anybody who is sincerely serving the Lord, I don't care how old or young, they are always watching. See, some, some people will will try to say, oh, you're paranoid. No, I ain't paranoid. I just know the devil is trying to kill me. And he's using anybody he could. I'm always watching. Not paranoid, but watching. I can tell you that. I'm watching. I'm doing what God told me to do. Be vigilant. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Jesus said, watch and pray. Let she fall into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. In hunger. Most of us Christians in America, we have not suffered that one too much. And thirst. I thank God I live in a city, man, that they have, they have a, a water place, man, that is... So powerful, the water is the purest water probably in America. It's an oasis. We don't suffer like that in America. And thirst, in fasting is often, in cold and nakedness. Paul went through it, my dear friends, but yet he rejoiced forevermore. Yet he prayed without ceasing. Yes, Yet he gave thanks in all things. And so, beloved, if we were to list all of the troubles that we are now facing or have faced recently or any time in our lives, I doubt very seriously we could come up with a list half as long as Paul's. Yet out of his difficult experiences, Paul commends himself and us to a life of thanksgiving, a life of thankfulness in all things. As long as we live, we ought to be thankful, grateful for every blessing. Oh, we've had days when uh, of abundance. We've had many days when uh, things were very thin. 
no matter the circumstances, no matter the situation, in everything, give thanks. Amen, somebody. Someone said, I thank thee, Lord, that in thy blood my guilt is washed away. I thank thee that mine eyes behold a bright and glorious day. I thank thee, Lord, for faith to see a world of endless joy, endless joy in thee. I thank thee for the throne of grace where thou doest bend thine ear, and I may breathe my soul's request when only thou canst hear and hold community but thine eye beholdeth me. I thank thee for the hope of life that looks beyond the tomb. I thank thee for the light that shines to cheer me through his gloom. And Lord, for all thy gifts to me, my loudest praise I give to thee. Let's stand for prayer. Holy Father God, we praise you and we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your mercy, your love, and your system of grace. We thank you for the foolishness of preaching. For it is the most powerful form of communication in the history of the world. Thank you for what you have done here today. Thank you for speaking to our hearts as Christians. And Lord, help us to do it. Help us, Lord, to rejoice evermore. Help us, Lord, to pray without ceasing. And help us, Lord, to understand in everything. We should give thanks. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and forsake. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Behind you. Behind you in the back. Now, beloved, if you are with us today and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ and the free pardon of your sins. If you're not born again, if you're not saved, understand the world can come to an end for you today through death or through the rapture of the church. Jesus Christ coming back at any moment, receiving those who have trusted him as Savior. You need to be ready. Your first prayer needs to be what we call the sinner's prayer. First, please understand that you are a sinner just as I am and that you have broken God's laws as I have. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That includes you, my dear friend. Secondly, accept the fact that there is a penalty for sin, as it is in this life. You don't believe it? Go get in your car and go 100 miles down the highway and see if they won't have you in jail. And then keep on going once the police get behind you. Just keep on driving like you on a little a journey, a little trip. You're going to be uh, on, in, uh, on a trip to jail. You're going to lose your freedom. Why? Because there's a penalty for crimes. There's a penalty for sin everywhere. In every country of the world. Even sinful human beings like we are, like us, have laws and commandments that we have made to keep the peace. That's why we call police officers peace officers. You just can't do what you want to do. Nowhere on earth, and certainly not in heaven. 
So there's a penalty for sin. There's a punishment for sin. You can't do it in a family either. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. The reason why we die is because of sin. Our bodies that was once walking on earth go is buried in a grave. The soul, if we have never trusted Christ as Savior, goes to hell. Hell is a real place. Jesus Christ preached on hell more than anybody in the Bible and most preachers today. Jesus Christ preached more on hell than he did about heaven. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 10:28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Hell is bad news. Hell is a place of torment. Hell is a place of pain. Hell is a place of gnashing of teeth. The pain is so bad. Have you ever been in pain where you, you, your teeth started grinding together? Well, that's how it is in hell. Hell is a, is a terrible place and hell is bad news. But I have good news for you. The good news is what Jesus Christ said in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Perish. Perish in hell forever. But have everlasting life. Now, hell is forever and heaven is forever. Okay, so both are forever. Just believe in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ. That he suffered and he bled and he died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose from the dead on the third day. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou, you, shalt be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. Saved to what? Saved to heaven. And then simply pray and ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart to save your soul, and he will. Romans 10, 9 and 13 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou you shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You don't have to join a church to be saved. You don't have to be in church to be saved. You don't have to get baptized to get saved. All of that will come later. It's all good stuff. But you don't have to do any of that to be saved. You don't have to uh, speak in some unknown language. You don't have to run around the church to be saved. You don't have to shout to be saved. You don't have to feel anything to be saved. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will be saved. The thief on the cross got saved by believing on Christ. He did not come down off the cross to get baptized or to join a church or to shake the preacher's hand. He was just, he was just as saved as anybody else. So believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust Christ as Savior. Pray with me this simple prayer called the sinner's prayer. Repeat after me phrase by phrase and mean it from your heart. Holy Father God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I have done evil in your sight. I've committed many sins. I have broken your Ten Commandments. I have fallen short. And I know that I deserve hell because of my sins. For Jesus Christ's sake, please forgive me of all of my sins. As I now believe with all of my heart that Jesus Christ suffered, bled, and died for my sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save my soul. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to truly repent of my sins 
Help me to turn from my evil ways. And help me to follow you, Lord Jesus, into the new life. In Jesus Christ's name I pray and for his sake. Amen. Now, dear friend, if you just trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you prayed that prayer with me and meant it from your heart, I declare to you that based upon the Word of God, the Bible, not our feelings and what we think, the Word of God, what the Bible says, what I just preached to you, you are now saved from hell and you are on your way to heaven. Welcome to the family of God, dear friend. Congratulations on trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have done the most important thing in life. For more information to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, please go to GospelLightSociety.com or stay where you are and read my pamphlet titled, What to Do After You Enter Through the Door. Jesus Christ said in John 10:9, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Until next time, my beloved, God loves you. Jesus Christ loves you. We love you by his grace. And may God bless you real good is my prayer. Let's all stand for our closing prayer. Come.